Hey guys, it's Gamma, and this is episode nine of Exposing the Cult, a podcast in which we take a look at what once used to be one of the most inclusive and prideful communities, the LGBT, and reflect on how it's been infiltrated by the cult of gender ideology. Now, you guys, I like to start the same way with each episode, first saying thank you. Thank you to everyone who comes back every week. Thank you to my followers, new and old. If you haven't already, make sure that you hit that subscribe button and don't forget to hit the little noti bell so that you are notified when I upload new content. If you want to support me, you can go to exposingthecult.com and order some merchandise. So let's talk about tonight's episode. And before we do, I'm going to kind of lead us into the conversation. I was in a Twitter space last night for overnight. Two spaces, technically, one space for a few hours, and then it became an after hours in which I co-hosted with a transsexual woman, and we were in that space for 10 hours, meaning I pulled an all-nighter and was on that space till like 1030 this morning. So I took a nice midday cat nap, and I am exhausted. I am actually quite tired tonight, so I am working very hard to keep my mind on track (laughs) and not misspeak. So bear with me a little bit tonight, you guys. If I seem a little bit different, it's because I am actually quite exhausted. But I've set this weekly deadline for myself, and I do not wish to miss those deadlines of a Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time upload. So Let's get into the subject. In that space, a conversation came up about John Money, and I was questioned on my belief that John Money is the father of gender ideology. And so tonight, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to talk about what makes something an ideology. What is the definition of ideology and what are the facets of an ideology? And then we're going to get into totalitarianism because that's what the government's been doing. They've been functioning in a totalitarian way and they use ideologies as a framework of control over the masses. There's a couple great short one minute, two minute videos that I found on YouTube that I will play for us to watch and discuss as well as uh, the Britannica definition of ideology. And um, those videos that I mentioned are going to give a little more context into how ideologies fall into totalitarianism. And then we're going to get deeper into what things are happening by the liberal party, specifically in this context, because we are talking about the um, executive orders from the Biden administration will be focused mostly on the U.S. However, it is important to note that if you aren't aware, this is occurring globally. These same kind of orders are being handed down in Canada, in the UK, in Scotland, in Ireland, New Zealand, Australia. This is a global phenomenon, which if we really wanted to rabbit hole, we could talk about globalism, but I'm not going to take us there today. (laughs) We're just going to talk about what is ideology And how do ideologies get used by totalitarian leaders or governments? So first, let's take a look at what an ideology is. This is from vocabulary.com. So this is just a short and simple, simple and sweet definition of ideology. An ideology is a set of opinions or beliefs of a group or an individual Very often, ideology refers to a set of political beliefs or a set of ideas that characterize a particular culture. It says that capitalism, communism, socialism, and Marxism are ideologies, but not all ism words are. Think cronism, a system of graft whereby friends unfairly help each other make money. Our English noun is from French ideologue, the suffix logi, used with many English words describing theories or doctrines, is from Greek logos, word, reason, speech, account. 
And it says here some definitions of ideology as a noun, an orientation that characterizes the thinking of a group or a nation. Synonyms would be political orientation, political theory. And I'm going to hit that C more. Oh, 51 types. Not going to read all of those, but it is a type of orientation, an integrated set of attitudes and belief. So the second noun is imaginary or visionary theorization. And it's a type of theorization, the production or use of theories. And when I see orientation, I just keep thinking about sexual orientation, sexual orientation, which in the Twitter space that I was in for those 10 hours today, um, we were also talking about different types of sexual orientations outside of the, you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and heterosexual. So for those of you who know, you know. And if you don't know, whoo, I've got some some TikToks that I plan on making. I just made a tweet tonight in regards to that space. Um, specifically, it's about AGP. And that was referred to as a sexual orientation. And that is that is something that only people who are in the cult of gender ideology would actually justify calling someone who is an AGP. And if you don't know what that means, it's an uh, autogynephiliac as having a sexual orientation. Um, and we, we see those very regularly on the internet today. Next, we're going to take a look at the Britannica and more information about ideology. So I have on my screen a page from the Britannica. This is on ideology. And it says that ideology is a form of social or political philosophy in which practical elements are as prominent as theoretical ones. It is a system of ideas that aspires both to explain the world and to change it. This article describes the nature, history, and significance of ideologies in terms of the philosophical, political, and international contexts in which they have arisen. Particular categories of ideology are discussed in the articles, such as socialism, communism, anarchism, fascism, nationalism, liberalism, and conservatism. Here on the podcast together, guys, we've discussed fascism, um, which kind of inherently includes a little bit of nationalism. We've touched it, haven't really focused on it. And obviously, we have been discussing liberalism as well. But I do want to dedicate some episodes in the future to socialism, communism, anarchism, and conservatism, because I would be a hypocrite if I didn't look at all of the isms, right? Um, let's see here. So origins and characteristics of ideology. The word first made its appearance in the French as ideologue at the time of the French Revolution, when it was introduced by a philosopher. We're going to call this philosopher Tracy because I don't want to butcher Tracy's name as a short name for what he called his science of ideas, which he claimed to have adapted from the epistemology of the philosophers John Locke and Et Bonnet de Condillac. I apologize for butchering that name as well. For whom all human knowledge was knowledge of the ideas. The fact is, however, that he owed rather more to the English philosopher Francis Bacon, whom he revered no less than did the fr earlier French philosophers of the Enlightenment. It was Bacon who had proclaimed that the destiny of science was not only to enlarge human knowledge, but to also improve the life of men on earth. And it was this union of the programmatic with the intellectual that distinguished Tracy's ideologue from those theories, systems, and philosophies that were essentially explanatory. The science of ideas was a science with a mission. It aimed at serving people, even saving them, by ridding their minds of prejudice and preparing them for the sovereignty of reason. Now, I want to focus on this last sentence of this paragraph, okay? It says, the science of ideas was a science with a mission, right? It was aimed at serving the people. Well, gender ideology is aimed at serving all people who suffer from gender dysphoria, right? Which in the cult's ideology includes children, which we know that it's proven at minimum 85% of children who go through puberty have gender dysphoria cleared up without issue. 
And um, puberty blockers are actually preventing that from occurring, that natural human experience from occurring. And we've talked about this before together. So it's saying even saving them, they're justifying and, and pushing this rhetoric that it says if you transition a child and give them puberty blockers, it's preventing children from committing suicide. However, this this data is is inaccurate. The studies are very loose and not a very good population of people. Um, these studies that keep trying to get pushed on us to make us believe that so many children kill themselves because they're not the right gender is absolutely ridiculous. I was told today that a, that a child who cuts themselves is gender dysphoric and must transition to save their life. I grew up knowing girls who cut themselves and these women are mothers today. 15, 20 years ago, had they been transitioned, they would probably have killed themselves because they weren't gender dysphoric. They were struggling with other mental issues. And that's the problem with gender ideology. They're using that umbrella, right? They're using that umbrella to, to suck up anybody who's got a mental issue, anybody who's got PTSD and trauma. They're saying, mm, it's gender dysphoria. It's gender dysphoria. That's your problem. You should transition. That's what you need to do. Otherwise, you will kill yourself, right? And then it says here, ridding their minds of prejudice. Well, I think that that would be indoctrinating um, those who refer to themselves as cishet white women or as <laughs> people like conservative aunts say, uh, liberal white women who need to stand the fuck down. <laughs> um they are pushing this trans rights activism so hard on everybody else that it's actually more divisive than than not. And then when they're sitting here talking about, oh, by the way, the prejudice would be that men are biologically men and women are biologically women. That's that is considered prejudice to trans ideology. And preparing them for the sovereignty of reason. The sovereignty of reason is government control. Just, just so we're all clear here, that is what the sovereignty of reason is. And if we look at the Biden administration and, and the United States specifically, and if we take a look at the um, executive orders that are being handed down that say things such as, you know, um, the state and the school can access private insurance of the child to ch transition a child without needing to get parental consent. That is not a sovereignty of reason. That is totalitarian control over our children. And that is not that is not what our society was built off of. Parents should have control over what happens to their children and the decisions that will impact their children for life. So it says here, Tracy and his fellow ideologues devised a system of national education that they believed would transform France into a rational and scientific society. Their teaching combined a fervent belief of individual liberty with an elaborate program of state planning. And for a short time under the directory from 1795 to 99, it became the official doctrine of the French Republic. Napoleon at first supported Tracy and his friends, but he soon turned against them. And in December of 1812, he even went so far as to attribute blame for France's military defeats to the influence of the ideologues of whom he had spoke with scorn. So this ideology has been from its inception. Oh, thus, excuse me. I'm, I was trying to read this screen, but perhaps I should turn to my left here, ladies and gentlemen. Thus, ideology has been from its inception a word with a marked emotive content, though Tracy presumably had intended it to be a dry technical term. Such was his own passionate attachment to the science of ideas, and such was a high moral worth and purpose as he assigned to it. The word ideologue was bound to possess him a strongly laudatory character. And equally, when Napoleon linked the name ideologue with what he had come to regard as the most detestable elements in revolutionary thought, he invested the same word 
with all of his feelings and disapprobation and mistrust, ideology was from this time on to play this double role of a term both laudatory and abusive, not only in French, but also in German, English, Italian, and all other languages of the world into which it was either translated or transliterated. I didn't know that Napoleon was the one who dubbed ideologies as as nefarious, but was he, where was he wrong? <laughs> he hasn't he wasn't he wasn't wrong. So <clears throat> some historians of philosophy have called the 19th century the age of ideology, not because of the word itself was so widely used but because so much of the thought of the time can be distinguished from that prevailing in the previous centuries by features that would now be called ideological. Even so, there is a limit to the extent to which one can speak today of an agreed use of the word. The subject of ideology is a controversial one, and it is arguable that at least some part of this controversy derives from disagreement as to the definition of the word ideology. One can, however, discern both a strict and loose way of using it. In the loose sense of the word, ideology may mean any kind of action, oriented theory, or any attempt to approach politics in the light of a system of ideas. Uh, kind of like forcing children to be transitioned or forcing parents to transition their children, otherwise the state will take away from them. as I drink a sip of my cold, cold coffee. <laughs> ideology in the stricter sense says fairly close to Tracy's original conception and may be identified by five characteristics. One, it contains an explanatory theory of a more or less comprehensive kind of human experience and the external world. Two, it sets out a program and generalized, <laughs> generalized, excuse me, generalized and abstract terms of social and political organization. Three, it conceives the realization of this program as entailing a struggle. Four, it seeks not merely to persuade, but to recruit loyal adherents, demanding what is sometimes called commitment. Five, it addresses a wide public, but may tend to confer some special role of leadership on intellectuals. In this article, the noun ideology is used only in its strict sense. The adjective ideological is used to refer to ideology as broadly defined. So I want to take a look at these five components of ideologue, right? Or ideology, as it says here. And the first one we're talking about, um, it says that it, it, it contains an explanatory theory of a more or less comprehensive kind about human experience and the external world. Well, the cult of gender, gender ideology likes to talk about the human experience of being of the opposite sex or excuse me, um, in, in their ideology, opposite gender, not sex. And number two, it sets out a program in generalized and abstract terms of social and political organization. Well, they infiltrated the LGBT, which was already in schools to allow children who were gay to have a, a safe space in society without feeling alienated or like, you know, maybe they couldn't go home and talk to their parents because their parents were super religious. But gender ideology infiltrated those safe spaces for gay kids and is now indoctrinating them with with rhetoric that they um, don't conform to binary norms. So their discomfort isn't because they're trying to understand their sexuality, but actually they're the wrong gender. Number three, it conceives the realization of this program as entailing a struggle. Well, yeah, because they're saying that these children are struggling with gender dysphoria, so they must transition. And they're using our children as a way to make all of us adults have to conform. Either you transition your child or you lose your child. That is making people conform to an ideology that we do not adhere to. Four, 
It seeks not merely to persuade, but to recruit loyal adherents, demanding what is sometimes called commitment. I don't know about you, but I think that it's definitely a commitment to transition as a child, have a double mastectomy, and then as a young adult, after you turn 18, to cut off your body parts and live as the opposite sex. I think that's quite the commitment. If you don't, if you don't agree, I would love to hear why you don't see that. And it addresses a wide public but may tend to confer some special role of leadership on intellectuals. So, essentially, um, with this one, a special role of leader leadership on intellectuals, I wouldn't say that gender ideology has intellectuals. I would say they have influencers. I think that in our society today, with the way that the internet is, um, that we have influencers who would be the philosophers of previous centuries, right? People who have all these different ideas and people like to follow them and listen to them and maybe enjoy their opinions or the content that they create. But I've said this before. I do think at this day and age, you don't need to have one centralized leader of a cult. You can have just enough, a handful of individuals that have a wide enough reach to different populaces of people that have, you know, been found by them right on the internet and then they're then able to indoctrinate them into the ideology because these individuals who are watching and consuming and absorbing their content are are just falling for this without even doing any research into it so we're going to keep on scrolling so it says here on the basis of the five features above then one can recognize as ideology systems as diverse as Tracy's own science of ideas, the positivism of the French philosopher Auguste Comte, communism, and several other types of socialism, fascism, Nazism, and certain kinds of nationalism, that all of these isms belong in the 19th or 20th century, may suggest that ideologies are no older than the word itself that they belong essentially to a period in which secular belief increasingly replaced traditional religious faith. I actually agree with that. I actually agree with that because if we look at the last couple hundred years, right, this was 1790, the 1790s of the French Revolution, right? 1800s, 1900s, we just got into the 2000s. Um, let's look at, for instance, my lifetime, just in the last 30 years, right? Um, I have seen people, I grew up in a Christian home. I went to church. I went to a Catholic school and I've seen people that I grew up with in those, in those environments, you know, that now today don't, don't consider themselves Christian. They don't participate. They don't have a religious faith. Um, you know, and it's, they don't believe in God. And I see a lot more people fracturing from the religion in which they were raised in and I, I do agree with that statement. I think that that is a big reason why ideologies are so prevalent, at least in this in this current climate that we have today, because nobody wants to be associated to the church. Um, there is I'm sidebarring now uh, it, when someone says to you, uh, you guys are so hyper focused on trans women who have committed sexual assault on children and women. But what about the priests? Fun fact, and I will drop the link to this into the doc, into my description, just as a for reference. It's not going to be a source source. It's going to be under a for reference source. Okay. I'll even put it in its own section. There was a 50 year study, a 50 year study in which they looked at the number of sexual assaults that were found to have occurred within the clergy right, by priests and other clergy members, and it was 216,000 children. That's, that's terrible. That's a lot of kids in 50 years. But if you look at the number of children within like a seven-year period in actual public schools and, and even private schools, education systems, okay, 3.5 million children Within a 10 year, so I'll even, I'll even say it was a decade, okay? 3.5 million children are sexually assaulted when they go to school by someone who's supposed to be their teacher and to help educate them 
on on politics and math and science and biology things that are they're supposed to be focusing on and they're not they're being taught about gender identity now and the dei diversion inclusion and if your kid misgenders someone they're put into a course that is literally course correction that's indoctrination so when someone tries to argue with you and tell you, well, what about the priests and use what aboutism? You reference the article that I will post in my description. 50 year study, 216,000 children. 10 years, 3.5 million in schools. Where is the real issue, right? But I digress back to this article. The philosophical context ideology and religion this is cool because i've been wanting to get into the religious aspect of uh gender ideology as well um and we've talked about that before ideologies in fact are sometimes spoken of as if they belonged to the same logical category as religions both are assuredly in the certain sense total systems concerned at the same time with questions of truth and questions of conduct but the differences between ideologies and religions are perhaps more important than the similarities. A religious theory of reality is constructed in terms of a divine order and is seldom like that of the ideologist, centered on this word alone. A religion may present a vision of a just society, but it cannot easily have a practical political program. The emphasis of religion is on faith and worship. Its appeal is to inwardness and its aim is the redemption or purification of the human spirit an ideology speaks to the group the nation or the class some religions acknowledge their debt to revelation whereas ideology always believes however mistakenly that it lives by reason alone both it may be said demand commitment but it may be doubted whether commitment has ever been a marked feature of those religions in which a believer is inducted in infancy. I think it's really important that we're reading this article. I actually am very much enjoying this because um, I think that there are gender ideologists who are absolutely blurring the lines between religion and, and um, ideology. For instance, there is a video that I've seen get taken down like as fast as it goes up on TikTok of a female preacher at a church praising they them God, the non-binary Jesus and um, singing the worship to the rain rainbow flag. So they're definitely starting to blur some lines. They're, they're blurring some lines here. And I mean, the article says itself that there is um a blurred reality so interesting i liked that as i'm actually looking at this again um where it says both it may be said demand commitment but it may be doubted whether commitment has ever been marked a marked feature of those religions into which a believer is inducted in infancy um when we look at cases of gender ideologists who say that their two-year-old is um, the opposite gender and they start transitioning toddlers. Um, I guess that is a question of, is that ideological or is that um, something of almost a religious aspect, right? Because if you are raised in a, in a Catholic home, a Christian home, a, a Jewish home, a Muslim home, right? You're raised in your religion. Could that not be the same for ideologues? Let's continue the article, shall we? Even so, it is in certain religious movements that the first ideological elements in the modern world can be seen. The city of Florence, which has so many fields, witnessed the birth of modernity, produced perhaps the first ideological Christian. The attempt of Girolamo Savonarola to construct a Puritan utopia was marked by several of the qualities by which one recognizes a modern ideology, Savonarola treated the vision of Christian community as a model that humans should actually seek to realize in the here and now. His method was to dominate the state through an appeal to the populace and then to use the powers of the state to control both the economy and the private lives of the citizens. The enterprise was given a militant spirit. It was presented by Savonarola as being at 
won and the same time an outward struggle against papal corruption, the commercial ethos and Renaissance humanism, and inward struggle against worldly ambitions and carnal desires. That is so interesting to me because when I think of state control, I think of state control over parental rights and um, parental parental units saying, no, we don't want to transition our child. We we believe that there is a different path that can help our child to heal psychologically, um, uh, to become more comfortable with who they are as an individual. And um, this ideology is being used by the state as a way to uh, disrupt the natural order of parents having the ability to speak on behalf of, care for, and raise their children. And the enterprise was given a militant spirit. I mean, we see, we see uh, these gender ideologists who say, you know, terror versus the world wanted to call to arms all trans people and LGBTQ people, uh, LGBTQ plus IA people, right, um, in order to say, you know, arm up and and be ready essentially to defend all trans people like they're trying to militarize a generation of people because of this gender ideology that's so hyper focused on transgenderism so i think that this is this is very good for all of us actually to learn a little bit about ideology and worldly ambitions and carnal desires i'm listen we like i said earlier tonight we will be getting further into agps in in i believe the next episode i committed to that so let's continue ideology and early political philosophy the italian political philosopher nicolai machiavelli was one of saravanola's sharpest critics but he was also, like him, a precursor of modern ideologists. Historians who speak of him only as an immoralist overlook the extent to which Machiavelli was a man with an ideal, a Republican ideal. Jean -Ju oh, excuse me, Jean-Jacques Rousseau recognized this when he spoke of the Principe, I guess it's the Principe, uh, which is the Prince, as a handbook for Republicans, Machiavelli's dream was to see revived in modern Italy a republic as glorious that of that of ancient Rome, and he suggested that it could be achieved only by means of a revolution that had the strength of will to liquidate its enemies. That sounds intense. Machiavelli was the first to link ideology with terror. But he was too much of a political scientist to enact the role of the ideologue. Interesting. I guess I guess I'm starting to understand the term that's Machiavellian. <laughs> OK, so <clears throat> 17th century England occupies an important place in the history of ideology, although they were then no fully fledged ideologies in the strict sense of the term political theory like politics itself began to acquire certain ideological characteristics. The swift movement of revolutionary forces throughout the 17th century was created a demand for theories to explain and justify the radical action that was often taken. Locke's Two Treaties of Government in 1690 is an outstanding example of literature written to justify individual rights against absolutism. This growth of abstract theory in the 17th century, this increasing tendency to construct systems and discuss politics in terms of principles, marks the emergence of ideological style. In political conversation generally, it was accompanied by a growing use of concepts such as right and liberty, ideals in terms of which actual policies were judged. Well, that makes sense to me, right? Because um, I think at the root of all political stances now, there's something ideological about it. Um, but there are extremists and extremism in certain ideologies. And I think that we all need to be a little more rooted in reality <laughs> and recognize those ideologies for what they are. Hegel and Marx. 
Although the word ideology, in the sense derived from Tracy's understanding, has passed into modern usage, it is important to notice the particular sense that ideology is given in Hegelian and Marxist philosophy, where it is used in a perjurative way. Ideology there becomes a word for that what these philosophers also call false, false consciousness. G.W.F. Hegel argued that people were instruments of history. They enacted roles that were assigned to them by forces they did not understand. The meaning of history was hidden from them. Only the philosopher could expect to understand things as they were. The Hegelian enterprise of interpreting reality and reconciling the world to itself was condemned by certain critics as an attempt to provide an ideology of the status quo. In that, if individuals were indeed more mere ciphers whose actions were determined by external forces, then there was little point in trying to change or improve political and other circumstances. This is a criticism Karl Marx took up, and it is the argument he developed in Die Dusch Ideals, Ideologe. Oh gosh, it's it, you know what? It's small on the screen. I'm gonna <laughs> if you're if you're watching, I'm trying to read the screen so I'm looking at the camera, but I'm gonna I'm gonna turn again real quick. It says, uh, ideologue. Ba, 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 ba. Yeah, Die Deutsch Ideologue, right? Or ideology. Written 1845 to 46. Published 1932. The German ideology and other earlier writings. Ideology, in this sense, is a set of beliefs with which people deceive themselves. It is the theory that expresses what they are led to think as opposed to which is true. It is false consciousness. Wow. Marx, however, was not consistent in his use of the word ideology, for he did not always use the term perjuratively, and some of his references to it clearly imply the possibility of an ideology being true. 20th century Marxists, who frequently discarded the perjurative sense of ideology altogether, were content to speak of Marxism as being itself an ideology. In certain communist countries, ideological institutes, and I apologize I didn't scroll for you guys, were established, and the party philosophers were commonly spoken as party ideologists. Marxism is an excellent example, a paradigm of an ideology. So it might be because I'm tired, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look back at this one more time real quick. So it's saying this is a criticism Karl Marx took up, and it is the argument that he developed and in other in other writings. Ideology in this sense is a set of beliefs with which people deceive themselves. It is the theory that expresses what they are led to think, as opposed to which is true. It is false consciousness. So I was actually in this live on TikTok about I think last week, actually, after I recorded episode eight, I popped into a live that American David was having, and he's got a lot of information about Marxism um, that I haven't really gotten a chance to look into. But he he said to me that he sees this gender ideology as a very Marxist movement. And I mean, if if by what we're reading here, it's saying that he said ideology is to for people to deceive themselves and and it is a theory that expresses what they are led to think uh, as opposed to which is true then yes gender ideology it, it does exactly that but then it goes on to say that he didn't always use the term perjuratively and he seemed to, that he wasn't consistent in how he defined these things and and i don't know enough about marxism myself there are individuals who speak more eloquently Yes, I will have to deep dive into Marxism to understand it more. We're going to keep going past it. Um, but if Marxism is then to be that statement that I just reread, then 100 percent, that is that is what gender ideology is doing. They want us to believe that any man who claims to be a woman is a woman, regardless of the fact if they look like one or not. We're not supposed to trust our eyes and our ears Eyes being what we see, ears being what we hear. We have to trust what they say is reality. And we we covered that when we talked about Newspeak and Doublethink and um, 1984. So 
Let's continue. The sociology of knowledge. The use of the word ideology in the perjurative sense of false consciousness is found not only in the writings of Marx himself, but in those of other exponents of what has come to be known as the sociology of knowledge, including the German sociologists Max Weber and Karl Mannheim, and numerous lesser figures. Few such writers are wholly consistent in their use of the term, but what is characteristic of their approach is their method of regarding idea systems as the outcome or expression of certain interests. In calling such idea systems ideologies, they are treating them as things whose true nature is concealed. They consider the task of sociological research to be the unveiling of what Mannheim called the life conditions which produce ideologies. I would say that that actually confirms for me that, you know, um, the cult of gender ideology is, I mean, it's in the name, right? Gender ideology is an ideology. Um, they have this belief that um, they're, they're concealing the true nature of biology, right? And they're permitting um, these associations to, they're, they're saying that, being an autogynephiliac is a sexual orientation. This is opening the door and allowing for um, pedophiles and pedophilia to be seen as a sexual orientation. This is, this is, mm, this is not okay. It's not okay. No, no, thank you. Let's continue. <laughs> From this perspective, the economic science of Adam Smith, for example, is not to be understood as an independent intellectual construction or to be judged in terms of its truth, consistency, or clarity. Rather, it is to be seen as the expression of bourgeoisie interests and as a part of the ideology of capitalism. The sociology of knowledge in subsequent formulations sought support in Freudian psychology, notably in borrowing from Sigmund Freud the concepts of unconscious and of rationalization. In order to suggest that ideologies are the unconscious rationalizations of class interests, this ref in, um, refinement enabled sociologists to knowledge to rid their theory of the disagreeable and unscientific element of bald accusation. They no longer needed to brand Adam Smith as a deliberate champion of the bourgeoisie ethos, but could see him as simply the unconscious spokesman of capitalism. At the same time, the sociologists of knowledge argued that Freudian psychology is itself no less a form of ideology than is Adam Smith's economics. For Freud's method of psychoanalysis is essentially a technique for adjusting rebellious minds to the demands and constraints of the bourgeois society. Critics of the sociology of knowledge have argued that if all philosophy is ideology, then the sociology of knowledge must itself be an ideology like any other idea system and equally devoid of independent validity. That if all seeming truth is veiled rationalization of interest, then the sociology of knowledge cannot be true. It has been suggested that although Weber and Mannheim inspired most of the work that has been done by sociologists of knowledge, their own writings may perhaps be ex exempted from this criticism. Oh, that's interesting. If all of these things are rooted in ideology, why is it that their ideology about ideology isn't an ideology? Is this ideology inception? I feel like it's ideology inception. Both used the word ideology in different ways at different times. Weber was in part concerned to reverse Marx's theory that all idea systems are products of economic structures by demonstrating conversely that some economic structures are the product of idea systems. That Protestantism, for example, generated capitalism and not capitalism, Protestantism. Mannheim, on the other hand, tried to restore in a more elaborate form Marx's suggestion that ideologies are the product of social structure. But Mannheim's analysis may have been obscured by his proposal that the word ideology should be reversed for idea systems that are more or less conservative. 
and the word utopia for idea systems of a more revolutionary or <laughs> millenarian nature. Mannheim did not, however, remain faithful to this stipulative definition, even in his book entitled Ideology and Utopia, an Introduction to the Sociology of Knowledge in 1929. On the other hand, Mannheim was well aware of the implication of the doctrine that all idea systems have a class basis and a class bias. As a way out of the dilemma, he envisaged the possibility of a classless class of intellectuals, a socially unattached intelligentsia, as he put it, capable of thinking independently by virtue of its independence from any class interest or affiliation. Such a detached group might hope to acquire knowledge that was not ideology, this vision of a small elite of superior mind rising above the myths of ordinary society seemed to be some readers to put Mannheim closer to Plato than to Marx and to cast new doubts on the claim of sociology of knowledge to be a science. The political context. Ideology, rationalism, and romanticism. If some theorists emphasize the kinship between ideology and various forms of religious enthusiasm, others stress the connection between ideology and what they call rationalism, or the attempt to understand politics in terms of abstract ideas rather than lived experience. Like Napoleon, who held the ideology is par excellence of the work of intellectuals, some theorists are suspicious of those who think that they know about politics because they have read many books. They believe that politics can be learned only by apprenticeship to politics itself. That's interesting. I wonder what I wonder what the majority of America would have to say about that. <laughs> Such people are not unsympathetic to political theories such as Locke's, but they argue that their values reside in the facts that are derived from experience. Michael Oakeshott in England described Locke's theory of political liberty as an abridgment of the Englishman's traditional understanding of liberty and suggested that once such a conception is uprooted from the tradition that is given its meaning, it becomes a rationalistic doctrine or metaphysical abstraction, like those liberties contained in the Declaration of Rights of Man and of Citizen, which were so much talked about after the French Revolution, but rarely actually enjoyed in France or elsewhere. Whereas Oakeshott saw ideology as a form of rationalism, Edward Schills, a U.S. political scientist, saw it more of a product of, among other things, romanticism with an extremist character. His argument was that romanticism has fed into and swelled the seas of ideological politics by its cult of ideal and by its scorn for the actual, especially its scorn for what is mediated by calculation and compromise. Since civil politics demands both compromise and contra contravence and calls for a prudent self-restraint and responsible caution, he suggested that civil politics is bound to be repugnant to romanticism. Hence, Schills concluded that the romantic spirit is naturally driven towards ideological politics. You know what? I don't know Schills very well. This is the first time I've, I've heard of Schills. And I think I like Edward Schills. We, we're going to have to look into Edward Schills a little bit. I think... I will see if there's any books written by Schills, and I'm intrigued. It could be, one, that this is a more modern political scientist, two, that it is an American political scientist, right? And if if we're tonight talking about America politics and, um, you know, totalitarianism, and we're talking about these uh, ideology, this ideology being used to be totalitarian, it would make sense. I mean, there is this whole romanticized argument and a cult of ideal, right? What is this podcast? Exposing the cult. And it says, the politics by its cult of the ideal and by its scorn for the actual. Meaning, it's ideal to perceive men as women, but they're not actually women. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, Shills, you're going on the list of things to research, sir. Ideology and terror. 
The total character of ideology, its extremism and violence have been analyzed by other critics among whom the French philosopher writer Albert Camus and the Austrian born British philosopher Sir Karl Popper merit particular attention. Beginning as an existentialist, existentialist, <laughs> I told you guys I was tired. Beginning as an existentialist who subscribed to the view that the universe is absurd, Camus passed to a personal affirmation of justice and human decency as compelling values to be realized in conduct. An Algerian by birth, Camus also appealed to what he believed to be Mediterranean tradition of moderation and human warmth and joy in living as opposed to the northern Germanic traditional uh, fanatical Puritan devotion to metaphysical abstractions. In his book, The Rebel from 1951, he argued that the true rebel is not the person who conforms to the orthodoxy of some revolutionary ideology, but the person who could say no to injustice. He suggested that the true rebel would prefer the politics of reform, such as that of a modern transunion socialist or trade union socialism to the totalitarian politics of Marxism or similar movements. The systemic and systematic violence of ideology, the crimes de logique that were committed in its name, appeared to Camus to be wholly unjustifiable. Hating cruelty, he believed that the rise of ideology in the modern world had added enormously to human suffering, though he was willing to admit that the ultimate aim of most ideologies was to diminish human suffering. He argued that good ends did not authorize the use of evil means. Damn, Camus. I like Camus, too. You know, let's talk a little bit. Let's sidebar and talk about the children. Because, you know, it's good intentions to think, well, these children have gender dysphoria, so we should we should transition them so that they don't, you know, commit suicide and that they'll be OK. But what's being done is is actually evil. Right. To to chemically castrate and to physically mutilate and take the breasts off of 13 year old girls. This is actually evil because they don't yet understand they're they're what? 13 years old, getting double mastectomies, 10 years old, 11 years old, being put on puberty blockers. They become inept. They become infertile. They'll never be able to breastfeed if they do tran the transition. Right. We are not allowing them to go through the most natural form of human experience, which is puberty, to determine whether or not they want to have children. We're, we are taking from these children because of gender ideology. A somewhat similar plea for what he called piecemeal social engineering was put forward by Popper, who argued that ideology rests on a logical mistake, namely the notion that history can be transformed into science. In Logic der Forschung, in 1934, The Logic of Scientific Discovery, Popper suggested that the true method of science was not one of observation, hypothesis, and confirmation, but one of conjecture and experiment, in which the concept of falsification played a crucial role. Huh. Wow. Wow. I, I'm I'm at a loss for words, guys, because as I'm reading this, I'm playing images in my head of all of the things that I see, the articles, the the laws being written, um, the things that these these um cult members say online, and I just think to myself, all of this is so representative of of this ideology. And when when we start talking about totalitarianism, you will understand if not already, why this is so dangerous. By this concept, he meant that in science, there is a continuing process of trial and error. Conjectures are put to the test of experiment, and those that are not falsified are provisionally accepted. Thus, there is no definitive knowledge, but only provisional knowledge that is constantly being corrected. Oh, I'm using that from now on. When when someone comes in and says there are studies, I'm going to say those are provisional studies. This is my new term. This is this is my new favorite term, ladies and gentlemen. Those are provisional 
studies. Wow. Good, good research tonight, guys. Popper saw in the enterprise of ideology an attempt to find certainty in history and to produce predictions on the model of what we're supposed to what were supposed to be scientific predictions. Ideologists, he argued, because they have a false notion of what science is, can produce only prophecies which are quite distinct from scientific predications and which have no scientific validity whatsoever. Though Popper was well disposed towards the idea of a scientific approach to politics and ethics, he suggested that a full awareness of the importance of trial and error in science would prompt one to look for similar forms of negative judgment elsewhere. By no means are all ideologists explicit champions of violence, but it is characteristic of ideology both to exalt action and to regard action in terms of a military analogy. Some observers have pointed out that one has only to consider the prose style of the founders of most ideologies to be struck by the military and warlike language that they habitually use, including words like struggle, resist, march, victory, and overcome. The literature of ideology is replete with martial expressions. In such a view, commitment to an ideology becomes a form of enlistment so that to become the adherent of an ideology is to become a combatant or partisan. In the years that followed World War II, a number of ideological writers went beyond the mere use of military language and made frank avowals of their desire for violence. Not that it was a new thing to praise violence. The French political philosopher Georges Sorel, for example, had done so before World War I in his book Reflections sur la Viance, in 1908, Reflections on Violence. Sorel was usually regarded as being more a fascist than a socialist. He also used the word violence in his own special way. By violence, Sorel meant passion, not the throwing of bombs and the burning of buildings. Violence found eloquent champions in several black militant writers of the 1960s, notably the Martensian theorist Franz Fanon. Moreover, several of the French philosophers Jean-Paul Sartre's dramatic writings turn on the theme that dirty hands are necessary in politics and that a person with so-called bourgeois in inhibitions about bloodshed uh, cannot usefully serve a revolutionary cause. Sartre's attachment to the ideal of revolution tended to increase as he grew older. And in some of his later writings, he suggested that violence might even be a good thing in itself. Really quickly, we are going to take a look at a video that popped up on Twitter today. Um, this is a clip of, I assume, multiple videos, but this is a um, trans right activist and a, I, as it appears, a trans woman who is standing in a square in the UK where the mayor of like London uh, basically was saying a pride day, pride day. Anyway, this is what gender ideologists do when they celebrate trans pride day to be specific and clear. This is a trans pride day that you're about to watch. Make sure I can get it to play for you guys with the sound because you, you need sound. And I recorded an early podcast episode and the sound wasn't there. And I feel guilty for that. But we live and we learn, right? Okay, here you go. Really fluffy and be really nice and say, yeah, be really lovely and queer and gay. No, if you see a turf, punch him in the fucking face. I was going to come here and be really... Just in case you didn't hear that. One more time. If you see a turf, punch him in the fucking face. This is, this is what is said about anybody who says, by the way, and we've talked about it before, you are a turf if you believe that men are men and women are women, like biology. If you are gender critical, you're a turf. If you don't want these trans women 
the gender ideology, transgender women in your spaces, in females, domestic violence shelters, in prisons, in um, bathrooms, in sports, in scholarships, then you are a turf. If you have any gender critical thing going on and you're a woman, you're a turf. And this is what they 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 say these things online. They make they make videos about this. They have signs they hold in protest of women rallies saying things like this death to turfs, death to cis women, death to the system. And and these are things that they 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 continue to do them. Right. Like it's not going to stop anytime soon because they're being platformed and elevated by governments around the world and they're being used to incite extremism and the government's taking advantage of it they absolutely are so let's continue with this article shall we in considering Satri's views on the subject of ideology, it must be noted that Satri sometimes used the word ideology in a sense peculiarly his own in an early section of his critique de la raison dialectique, critique of the dialectical reason, Satri drew a distinction between philosophies and ideologies in which he reserved the term philosophy for those major systems that fought, such as the rationalism of Des Descartes and or the idealism of Hegel, which dominate people's minds at a certain moment in history. He defined an ideology as a minor system of ideas living on the margin of the genuine philosophy and exploiting the domain of the greater system. When Satri proposed in his work was a revitalization and modernization of the major philosophy of Marxism through the integration of elements drawn from the ideology or minor system of existentialism. What emerged from the book was a theory in which the existentialist elements are more conspicuous than the Marxist. Interesting. Ideology and pragmatism. A distinction is often drawn between the ideological and the pragmatic approach to politics, the latter being understood as the approach that treats particular issues and problems purely on the merits and does not attempt to apply doctrinal Preconceived remedies. Theorists have debated whether or not politics have become less ideological and whether a pragmatic approach can be shown to be better than an ideological one. On the first question, there seemed to be good reason for thinking that after the death of Stalin and the repudiation of Stalinism by the Communist Party, the Soviet Union at least was becoming more interested in the pragmatic concerns of national security and the balance of power and less interested in an ideological aim of fostering universal communism. Then in turn seemed to many to have resulted in both the United States and the Soviet Union. In a shift towards a pragmatic policy of coexistence and a peaceful division of spheres of influence, there were indications in many countries that the old antagonisms between capitalist and socialist ideologies were giving way to a search for techniques for making a mixed economy work more effectively and for the good of all. But while many observers believed that there was much evidence of a decline of ideology in the later 1950s, others believed that there were equally manifest signs in the following decades of a revival of ideology, if not within major political parties, then at least among the public generally. Throughout the world, various left-wing movements emerged to challenge the whole ethos on which pragmatic politics was based. Not all these ideologies were coherent, and none possessed the elaborate intellectual structure of the 19th century ideologists, but together they served to demonstrate that the end of ideology was not yet at hand. <laughs> they basically said that liberal ideologies are incoherent and unintelligent. I'm just, that's what the Britannica says, guys. Just wanna make note of that. As suggested earlier, certain controversies about ideology have to some extent been rooted in the ambiguity of the word itself. And this is perhaps especially relevant to the confrontation between ideology and pragmatism, since the word pragmatism raises problems no less intractable than the words involved in connection with the word ideology. 
In the senses outlined at the beginning of this article, ideology is manifestly not the only alternative to pragmatism in politics, and to reject ideology would not necessarily be to adopt pragmatism. Ordinary language does not yet yield as many words as political science needs to clarify the question, and it becomes necessary to introduce such expressions as belief system or to name the relevant distinctions to further the analysis. Almost any approach to politics constitutes a belief system of one kind or another. Some such belief systems are more structured, more ordered, and generally systematic than others. Though an ideology is a type of belief system, not all belief systems are ideologies. One person's belief system may consist of congeries of ill-assorted prejudices and inarticulate assumptions. Another's may be the result of deep reflection and careful study. It is sometimes felt to be convenient to speak of a belief system in, of this latter type as a philosophy, or better to distinguish it from philosophy in the technical or academic sense, as a Weltanschauung, literally a view of the world. The confrontation between ideology and pragmatism may be more instructive if it is translated into a distinction between the ideological and the pragmatic, taking these two adjectives as extremes on a sliding scale. Okay, I'm going to pretend to be a sliding scale with my hands here. From this perspective, it becomes possible to speak of the differences of degree to speak of an approach to politics as being more or less ideological or more or less pragmatic. At the same time, it becomes possible to speak of a belief system, such as liberalism, as lending itself to a variety of forms, tending at the one extreme towards the ideological and towards the other, the pragmatic. Interesting that they're talking about liberalism specifically in this way. I wonder if where conservatism is going to get mentioned. We're almost to the end, so we'll see. The context of international relations it has been said that ideology transformed international relations in the 20th century. In appearance, at least earlier centuries experienced dynastic wars, national, civil, and imperial wars, and diplomacy, designed to further national security or national expansion, or to promote mutual advantages and general peace. Such factors indeed appeared to govern international relations until recent times. International relations during most of the 20th century were seemingly dominated by the exigencies of isms wars were fought alliances were made and treaties were signed because of ideological considerations the balance of power in the world was a balance weighted by ideological commitment the communist bloc confronted the free peoples and in the third world emergent nations cultivated a nationalist anti-colonist Ideolo ideology in their search for identity and their efforts to achieve modernity. But this is not to assert that ideological wars or ideological diplomacy were entirely new. What became the most conspicuous element of the 20th century international relations, so conspicuous that other elements were often entirely ignored, was present to a lesser degree in earlier international relations. It is necessary here to distinguish between the actual events of history and the interpretations that are put on history. For some events lend themselves more readily than others to an ideological interpretation. The ideological perspective became increasingly significant as the general public came to play a role in considering questions of war and peace. When questions of defense and diplomacy were settled by kings and their ministers and wars were fought by professional soldiers and sailors, the public was not expected to have any opinion about international relations, and in such a situation, there was little place for ideology. <sighs> do you guys think that's why? Do you, do you think that's why they want globalism? They want globalism because they want to be able to control like the narrative of of diplomacy. And so they're trying to use this ideology to like consume us, right? And and there's this two videos I mentioned to you that I'm going to play as soon as we finish this article, but that was just like an aha moment for me. Ideology in the World Wars. 
This is our last section, I think, of this article here. Oh, there might be just a little bit more, but. In the course of World War I, however, a new element appeared to have been introduced. The war was seen by those who experienced it as being in its early stages of national war of the traditional kind. And such, it was not at first expected to assume any profoundly disturbing form. Each combatant people viewed itself as fighting for a king and a country in just in a just war. But by 1916, the Allies were being urged to think about their endeavor as a war to make the world safe for democracy. And the Germans on their side were correspondingly encouraged to visualize the war as a struggle of culture against barbarism. On both sides, the casualties were far more terrible than anyone had foreseen, and the need to sustain the will to war by an appeal to ideology was plainly felt by all the nations involved. Whether such war aims were really the main objectives of the government's concern is another question. What is important is that as the need was increasingly felt for a justification of war, the justification took an ideological form. Whether or not World War I changed its real nature between 1914 and 1918, the prevailing conception of it underwent significant alteration. This became more marked after the Russian Revolution of 1917, when the Bolsheviks submitted to harsh German peace terms for reasons that were not only practical, but ideological, namely the preservation and promotion of communism. President Woodrow Wilson took the United States into war with the Allied side with an alternative ideological vision, that of ensuring permanent peace through the League of Nations and the establishing democratic governments in all of the conquered countries. The rise of communism clearly marked a corresponding increase in the role of ideology in international relations. Fascism helped to speed the process. The Spanish Civil War of the 1930s was an almost clear-cut confrontation between ideologies of the left and right, not nearly clear-cut because of the ambiguous relationship between communism and anarchism. The precise extent of ideological commitment in World War II is a matter of some controversy. At one level, the 1939 war is seen as a continuation of the War of 1914, Two of the leading protagonists, Great Britain and the United States, agreed more in their anti-ideological stance and their hostility to Nazism than in promoting an alternative ideology. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, suspicious of British and of French imperialism and eager to cultivate a progressive ideological outlook, was critical of Prime Minister Winston Churchill's politics, hostile towards Charles de Gaulle's, but surprisingly tolerant of Joseph Stalin's. The revival of Wilson's idealistic war aims in the Atlantic Charter provided a basis for a kind of general ideological union of the Allies. But such formulations proved to be of small significance compared with the profound ideological commitment of the Soviet Union to communism and that of the United States to an international position more ideologically anti-communist than pro-anything. So that's interesting. They're basically saying they went to war, not because they had another ideology to, to defend, but basically to say, we're not go we're not doing that. Right. Um, honestly, I would say there's, there's a bit of a, a war going on when it comes to gender ideology. There, are, there are 6 billion people in the world. And if trans is supposed to be like 0.02% of the population of the world, right then why is it that the entire world is being forced to conform to this ideology and we're seeing a 4,000% rise in children claiming to be non-binary and trans if they're not being indoctrinated into an ideology, right? And at this point, it, it's, people are like, they don't, they don't want this ideology. There, there is, in a sense... There is a war going on between people who, like myself, say we are rooted in reality and those who are trying to blur the lines of of, you know, gender and biological sex and want to indoctrinate our children and, and gray the lines, if you will. OK, so this is the final the final paragraphs here. 
ideology of the Cold War. What came to be called the Cold War in the 1950s must be understood to a large extent as an ideological confrontation, and whereas communism was manifestly an ideology, the non-communism or even the anti-communism of the West was negatively ideological. To oppose one ideology was not necessarily to subscribe to another. Although there was a strong body of opinion in the West that felt that the free world needed a coherent ideology if it was to successfully resist an opposing ideology. What did I just say? See, someone today came onto my Twitter thread and um, because Leah Remney had made a post and we've talked about Leah on this podcast before. We've read the letter that was written by the, the Scientologists about Leah. And so I posed a question and I said, you know, I'm interested to hear from someone who has defected from a cult. If you recognize any patterns or similarities to gender ideology, because they, we see the way that that detransitioners are treated because of um, gender ideology. Right. And, and it, it, we see that they're being told they're never really trans. Leah was told you're never really a true Scientologist. Right. Um, we say grifter. Scientologists have another word for a uh, defector, I believe, or something along that lines is what they refer to as Leah. There are parallels, right? And there and there are so many of these uh, cult members who are saying, you're the one in a cult. You just how look at you trying to get the attention of someone. And I said, how else am I supposed to get the attention of Leah fucking Remini, right? Other than to respond to a tweet that she made and said, hey, I would genuinely like to know what your perspective is as someone who has been in, an, in a cult and is a famous person. How would else would I, a small creator, be able to reach someone of that stature other than to tweet her? And they're coming for me. They're like, you're the one who's indoctrinated into a cult. You're the one. You're the one. But we see here, it literally says to oppose one ideology was not necessarily to subscribe to another. Although there was a strong body of opinion that they felt there should be another coherent ideology. I would honestly say that that being rooted in reality isn't an ideology. It is understanding that fundamentally there are biological males and there are biological females. Gender ideology wants to abolish the definition of woman. And they haven't officially come for man, but they've come for gay men. They've come for those men. And so what they're doing is they're trying to gray those lines. They're trying to abolish what we know to be true. And it, it's funny to me when when I, you know, talk about the cult of gender ideology and then I see people who are indoctrinated come into my Twitter threads and and try to say things to me. Right. To say, well, you're the one in the cult and you don't even realize you're in a cult. But the Britannica tells me that I don't have to be in a cult to recognize one. So who's wrong here? <laughs> oh, I, I, I think I'm going to be quoting this this section here as well. The connection between international wars and ideology can be better expressed in terms of a difference of degree rather than of kind. Some wars are more ideological than others, although there is no clear boundary between an ideological and non-ideological war. Just an FYI, this war that's going on that hasn't escalated to a physical war, but is all verbal, mental, political right now, it, it's, it's still a war. An analogy with the religious wars of the past is evident, and there is indeed some historical continuity between the two types of wars. The Christian crusades against the Turks and the wars between Catholics and Protestants in the early modern Europe have much in common with the ideological conflicts of the 20th century. Religious wars are often communal wars, as witness to those between Hindus and Muslims in India, but an ideological element of a kind can be discovered in many religious wars, even those narr narrated in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, in which the people of Israel are described as fighting for the cause of righteousness, fighting, in other words, for a universal abstraction as distinct from a local and practical aim. In the past, this ideological element has in the main been subsidiary, what is characteristic of the modern period is that the ideological element became increasingly dominant, 
first in the religious wars and the related diplomacy that followed the Reformation, and then in the political wars and diplomacy of the 20th century, Maurice Cranston, the ed editor, uh, excuse me, the editors of the Encyclopedia Britannica. I actually really enjoyed reading this entire um, breakdown and article about ideology. And, and I think that it's important because we keep saying gender ideology, gender ideology. And, and now we together have more of a context of what ideology is. So I'm going to next pull up um, a couple of videos. They're about, about 60 seconds um, and they're by some YouTube creators who I'm going to credit in the description below as well. So we're going to watch those to get a little bit of a highlight on totalitarianism and how ideology is used for totalitarianism. It seems in my um, research, I, I was moving things around and, and lost one of these short 60 seconds about totalitarianism. And I really liked that video and hopefully I'll be able to find it and I'll just tweet it out later. But um, there is a video by Theory and Philosophy. Um, this this YouTuber has 57,000 subscribers, so I think that they're a little good at what they do. <laughs> and um, specifically, this is like a 17 minute video. I'm just going to show a, a small portion of it to you guys, and then we're going to talk about it. This is starting at about uh, two minutes into the video, and I think that this is a very good um, overview of totalitarianism. So we're going to go ahead and get into it. I'm going to bring it up for you guys on YouTube to watch, and it should be loud enough for you to hear on podcast. Well, I'll tell you exactly why, but just, just give me a minute. Now, in its simplest form, totalitarianism is a political system that governs masses. That is, it doesn't govern classes. It doesn't govern individuals. It governs a mass. And that mass can only come about. I'm going to pause for a second. You've heard me talk about the umbrella, right? And we're in real time seeing the umbrella take over more. First, it was the umbrella of sexuality. It was the umbrella of transness, the umbrella of non-binary, the umbrella of autistic, the umbrella of, um, as I said earlier in this space, uh, autogynephiliacs, right? So they're pulling all these people into this umbrella, creating a giant mass that they can have to use to weaponize and to control. But let's continue to listen to what this, what this gentleman has to say. About if other distinctive qualities between people have been erased, like class. So or sex and gender, right? He's talking about erasing qualities, redefining lesbianism as non-men liking non-men, redefining woman to include anyone who feels they are a woman. They are graying the lines and they are taking away our ability to have individualism and definitions that differentiate us, which is important in society. It's, it's not to make us unequal, but it is important that we recognize that those differences in society no longer, at least when she was describing this at the time, between the period between World War I and World War II in Europe, no longer were there such strict delineations between lower classes and upper classes. Something happened in that period, and really the history goes back much further, but you gotta listen to all my episodes to really get that feel of what went on there. But something happened between World War I and World War II when, the, when people began to lose their affiliation with various classes, with other kinds of identities, and began to instead associate with this thing called the nation in a very homogenous way. So you'd have upper class people mingling with lower class people, and they found some solace, they found a kind of new community around this idea of the nation. And I think that this probably jives with what we might all know about totalitarianism, at least how we've understood it historically, be it uh, Stalinist totalitarianism or in Nazi Germany, that totalitarianism, there is a heavy emphasis upon nationhood and nationality. But Arendt is very clear that there's actually something else going on here. And 
totalitarianism doesn't just come about when the idea of the nation gets proffered up. It has to come at the expense of something. And that's something, well, it's actually many things, but in this case, it's specifically at the expense of the idea of the state. So before this time, really coming up around the year 1800, when there are all these burgeoning ideas about human equality and you know, freedom, the nation state was emerging as a, an institution that was going to defend these rights for people, defend people's liberties, defend people's freedom of speech, defend people's uh, ab ability to organize and to rally. Over time though, the equilibrium between the idea of the nation, which is kind of a nebulous ephemeral thing that would be associated with a kind of identity, a national identity, and the state, which is a more legislative, uh, physical body, you know, you think of government institutions and everything like that, there needed to be a delicate balance between the two under the nation state or within the nation state. Now, what happened between World War I and World War II, according to Arendt, is that the idea of the nation began to supersede that of the state. So what, what we saw was the nation eclipse the state. So there was a complete and utter renunciation of everything to do with the state, which meant a renunciation of party, of politics, of government, of all of its institutions, except for the police and the army, in favor of a more uh, representative body that would represent the nation. Now, at the time as well, there were these... I want to pause there <clears throat> because... Uh, you know, they do say that history repeats itself. We're talking about a hundred years ago right now. OK, we're talking about how um, they instead of having state regulators for the local populace and what those people want for themselves, it is an over encompassing power of the nation saying that this is how it must be. Right. And and we see the Biden administration enacting things. Um, we see judges taking uh, state decisions like DeSantis's uh, bill to prevent the gender affirming care for minors to protect children. And we see a judge who has a history of siding with Stonewall and siding with liberal uh, perspectives and, and making judgments based on liberal ideals who um, who said, no, you, you can't do that. That is unconstitutional. And now and now it's being appealed so that the state has the right to make that choice. The only states that the government currently, the administration currently, is not saying you're not allowed to enact that law are the states that are pushing gender affirming care. We didn't see any judges come forward and say you are not allowed to take children away from parents for not affirming their gender. But we are seeing the, the Biden administration come down and say you are not allowed to not affirm a child's gender and gender ideology is is being used to gain that control over parents and to separate children from parents i think we'll probably go on for a couple minutes more with this video and then i really want to get into some of these executive orders that biden's put out emerging ideas about race and how race was something that could be determined on the basis of one's, uh, certainly on one's skin, one's heritage, one's nation. And so a certain people became associated with that national identity. Now in Nazi Germany, I think that we're all pretty well familiar that this, this became a white-centered state, an ethno-state designed specifically for the interests of white Christian, German white Christian people at the expense of those people who were not considered pure-blooded white Germans, Jewish people, for example, who were a race that were considered outside of that paradigm, Roma people, disabled people, gay people, all of these other people were justified to belong outside of this nation and were therefore considered to be a threat. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I didn't mean to cough for you guys. Um, it's been a long night and I'm I'm going to hide this, whatever cup this is. You can probably see the label, but I need to have a drink. A little ASMR for you, if I shall. Okay, we're going to get back to it. Listen, what was just said by this man here in regards to 
being different, labeled as a threat, right? If you are not within the LGBTQIA+, and you are cis, and you are quote-unquote gender critical, you are a threat to gender ideology, and they treat us as such. We watched that video. What what is the threat to me saying I am I am not going to allow my child to be socially transitioned in school and and have and you know the state tell me they'll take my child away for not gender affirming them? What about that makes me a threat? It is a threat that you will take my child because I don't believe in your ideology. It is a threat that you go and stand on podiums and want to punch people in the throat for not agreeing with your ideology. So um, we've talked, just gotten a little brief overview, okay, of this history. And I wish I wish I could have found the other video um, by a different creator in which they said that, you know, um, it's based on the framework of ideology. And um, I'll see maybe if I can find that. Again, I will tweet it, I will tweet it for you. But let's take a look real quick at the latest executive order from the Biden administration, shall we? So there's actually three different um, executive orders that I'm going to be dropping in the description. I'm not going to read them in their entirety because that would make this podcast like three and a half hours long. But on the executive order on advancing equality for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex individuals, June 15th, 2022, section two, addressing harmful and discriminatory legislative attacks on LGBTQI plus children, youth, and families. A, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, HHS, shall, as appropriate and consistent with applicable law, use the Department of HHS authorities to protect LGBTQI plus individuals access to medically necessary care from harmful state and local laws and practices and shall promote the adoption of promising policies and practices to support health equity, including the area of mental health care for LGBTQIA plus youth and adults. Within 200 days of this date of this order, the secretary of HHS shall develop and release sample policies for states to safeguard and expand access to health care for LGBTQI plus individuals and their families, including mental health services. I want to highlight this section, and, and I'm sorry to the YouTube channel. I'll, I'll scroll down here. This section two here. Um, <clears throat> if you look at this and what we just talked about in regards to totalitarianism, taking the nation and and one ideology and, and encompassing and engrossing itself over the state instead of having a balance. We, the United States, are supposed to have a balance. Different states have different perspectives and, and sway different ways. Some states are, are implementing laws that are parental rights laws. They are protecting and establishing women's bill of rights. They are protecting parental rights to have autonomy over their children and to protect their children from indoctrination. I read a good portion of this executive order just now. It's not here on the podcast because I, I, I can't read you all three at this moment in time. Um, I think I'll probably make uh, some TikTok videos and post those. I'll probably do separate videos specifically just on these executive orders and upload them as well. But when we talk about totalitarianism, trying to uh, take the what the leadership a political party wants and implementing those and making those something a state has to conform to, that is totalitarianism. They're sitting here demonizing states, which means demonizing populaces within the United States, citizens who say we don't want this for our children. And they're turning around and saying, when they say mental health care, they're saying gender affirming care, gender affirming care. They're not sending your child to a psychologist to be analyzed, to discuss trauma, to deal with their issues. It's not psychology that was 20, 30 years ago. They send them to psychologists who will affirm a child's gender because they fear being fired and alienated. It's, it's, it's just a fact. This is what happens. People are afraid to speak up and speak out. So 
I wanted to point that one out. Let me pull up the next one for you. The second executive order is executive order on preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation. Okay, and I'll, I'll zoom out just a little bit so the whole thing can be seen on the YouTube. I want to specifically focus just on this portion. Discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation manifests differently for different individuals, and it often overlaps with other forms of prohibited discrimination, including discrimination on the basis of race or disability. For example, transgender black Americans face unconscionably high levels of workplace discrimination, homelessness, and violence, including fatal violence. If you don't recognize that this administration is specifically using um, black Americans and specifically transgender black Americans to further this agenda of gender ideology, I think that you should probably be paying attention more to um, Candace Owens and Blair White. <laughs> I think that you should probably be paying attention to um other individuals that are speaking up on behalf of these things because these statistics are actually inaccurate there there's actually not a higher number of transgender black americans this isn't this isn't happening in the way that they're saying that it's happening um they're pulling an orwellian 1984 um if they if the party says that something is the truth then it must be the truth and this is a a false truth that they are trying to push onto people to continue to make um, black Americans seem like they're incapable of succeeding and thriving in our society and that they are disproportionately being targeted and and we're not seeing that as true. So one more policy to look at. This last um, White House fact sheet that I'm going to read is the Biden-Harris administration advances equality for transgender Americans. Specifically, I want to highlight one little section here. Taking steps to expand the availability of accurate federal IDs for transgender, gender nonconforming, and non-binary Americans. Every American deserves access to forms of federal identification that respect and dignify their gender identity. Today, the State Department announced that it is updating agency procedures to remove burdensome medical documentation requirements for transgender Americans who wish to update their gender markers on their passports and other citizenship or identity documents. The State Department also announced that it is beginning to process to add a third gender marker for gender nonconforming, non-binary, and intersex Americans, and will work closely with interagency partners to ensure a smooth travel experience as possible for all passport holders. What I have to say about that is that this is dangerous because it's going to be manipulating and messing with demographics. There are actual rapists with sexual assault records who have served prison time or currently are in prison that because of this kind of enactment by this administration can change their gender marker, can change their name, and can disappear within society and get away with having been one person who is probably a... who. <laughs> It's probably out of gynephiliac because they've got a history of abuse to women, raped women, are now trans women, and um, have in instances we're seeing, and, and I'm seeing them on Twitter, pedophiles, actual pedophiles who became trans women. Oops, that's my notifications. Actual pedophiles who became trans women and were able to change their names and change their gender and you know what it does? It messes with demographics. There should be no reason that a female's demographic is going to be manipulated or modified because of a biological male's crime. That should never happen. And I think it is a dangerous and slippery slope what is being done by the Biden administration. I encourage you to go to all of these sheets that, that I have referenced for you here. And please... Take a look at them. I mean, this is, 
I was getting into the depths of the first two um, executive orders and I actually started to get a little bit nervous. I genuinely started to get a little bit nervous. So please do look into them after you stop listening to the podcast today. I think that it's time that we kind of close um, the podcast for this week, but autogynephiliacs and AGPs are coming to you for episode 10. So please be mentally prepared for that conversation that we are going to have. Uh, again, I want to say thank you all so much for listening to my podcast, uh, subscribing. And if you haven't and you're still here, please subscribe, uh, liking, sharing the content, retweeting my content. Make sure that you go to my link tree and follow all my socials. You can support me again by going to exposingthecult.com and purchasing merchandise. I've got lots of cool things out there for you to check out. Um, again, because I'm, I'm not going to be able to get to everyone. Not everyone is going to understand what I am saying. But if I'm consistent in the things that I say and the way that I say those things, eventually you'll realize what I am trying to tell you. And that is why I'm exposing the cult. And I hope to continue to be able to expose you to the truth. And as I go through my research, I genuinely want to share it with you. I'll see you on the next one.